right, so for this video, we're going to go over central venous access devices, also known as CVADs. Um, essentially, what a CVAD is, it's a long, thin, flexible tube, um, IV tube, and we put it through a large vein in the skin. So you can see how large this is. Now, this one in particular would go in the subclavian area, maybe in through the neck area and sit like that or like this, okay? Um, this one is called a triple lumen because it has three different lines on it. And the cool thing about the central lines that have multiple lumens, it might be hard to see, but you see there's three different sites, okay? So I could technically run three different medications or solutions that are incompatible and it's totally fine to do that through this. So um, typically we have a proximal, a medial, and a distal lumen. The distal is going to be furthest. The middle is in the middle and then the proximal is whatever one is closest to the patient. Um, so when this is inserted, the proximal one is gonna be down here. Then we have the middle and then the distals on the end. We have the hub, which is this piece here, this is the hub. This is called uh, the injection cap. It can also be called a microclave. More specifically, this is a microclave because it has the lure lock. And remember, this is our simple connector because we're gonna need um, the blunt cannula or alligator clamp in order to access it. This one is your lure lock, the complex one, and that's where the syringe is just gonna screw on there without any attachment. We have the clamps, and with central lines, we always wanna clamp in between doing things, just as an additional safety mechanism. Okie doke. Um, so where can we find these central lines? So we can find them in, like almost the antecubital area where we use the brachial um, artery. And this is, would be a peripherally inserted central catheter or a pick line. If it's a midline, it's below the antecubital and it only goes, the tip of it'll end up here in the forearm. Whereas a pick line is gonna go all the way up through the subclavian vein and it's gonna terminate in the, uh, right above the superior vena cava. So these lines are a lot longer than that little peripheral catheter that we had in a regular IV. So this one is a triple lumen central line and this is in the subclavian vein. Like I said, if it's in the neck, it could be the external jugular vein this down here, this long one, this is a long-term catheter and it's tunneled so it gets um, a good portion of it implanted under the skin and then you have this long attachment. We use these a lot of times for patients that are getting total parenteral nutrition. Um, they can be called um, Hone catheters, Hickman's, Groshong's, or Broviac's. They can have a single lumen like this. They could be double, tri triple, uh, even quadruple lumen. Non-tunneled catheter is our guy up here. So our triple lumen subclavian up here. This is not tunneled underneath of the skin at all. So we call it a non-tunneled. Um, any of our patients that are intensive care or maybe their oncology cancer patients are gonna be more likely to have one of these triple lumen lines so that they have a lot more IV access availability. And then we have metaports or power ports that get implanted underneath the skin and then we use this Huber needle, Huber, um, to access it. So a lot of our oncology patients have a plant implanted and they can go in and get their treatments. They'll use the Huber needle to access it and um, receive their chemotherapy that way. So those are some of the different types of central lines that you will see. As far as lab goes, um, we're going to focus here on our triple lumen subclavian uh, CVAD. 
And when we're talking about the care and assessment of the CVAD, a lot of it is very similar to that peripheral line. We would want to look for any redness, any signs of infection, um, oozing, maybe there's blood, maybe there's purulent drainage or pus-like drainage, um, warmth, we don't want to see that. We don't want to see any signs of phlebitis, infiltration, or extravasation. If you need to review those, um, please go back to the beginning of the peripheral IV stuff where I kind of go over that again. Um, because there can be infiltrations, infiltrations and extravasations with central lines, um, just so that you're aware. It's not just peripheral lines that that happens to. Um, we want to make sure that these lines are patent at all times. So the difference with a central line and a peripheral line is you want to get blood return when we go to flush for patency. You have to pull back to get blood return and then flush. Um, otherwise, we don't want to be using that. Um, and then, of course, this dressing definitely needs to be sterile when we are doing dressing change on that. If the dressing is lifting, of course, we would want to change that right away. We would want to notify the provider if we see any signs of infection going on. If we're not using the lines, they should be clamped. Um, let's see. Central line infection is a big thing. So, um, again, like I was saying with the peripheral IV for 15 second scrubs with your alcohol swabs, very, very important to do the same thing here, the full 15 seconds. Don't, don't short that. We want to make sure it's, there's not knots or kinks or tangles in your lines as well, uh, which could signify integrity issues. All right. Usually dressings are good for about seven days, um, but again, look at your facility policy and usually when we change the dressing, we also would be changing the caps uh, if they hadn't been changed already. So we would keep an eye on that. So that's the central line. We're going to go through essentially the same process that we did with our peripheral IVs. We're going to focus on our triple lumen here. And in light of time, I've already primed my line, my primary line for our patient here. Now we're using simple connectors here. So I'm going to need an alligator clamp in order to access this. These are not going to screw on. So I'm going to use an alligator. And I need to make sure that the alligator clamp is on there and make sure it primes all the way through so that we're not giving our patient any air. So this is what an alligator clamp looks like. And again, we just peel like the banana to maintain sterility. And I'm gonna finish priming this through so I don't give our patient any air. So that's all primed through. We have our order. Um, this time they want us to do 75 mLs per hour of saline. So just like we did last time, we opened our hatch here. Make sure that this orange clamp is all the way flat against the machine. We're making sure our piggyback port is above the pump. We've threaded it through. Turn it on. I'm going to primary rate. We said 75. Let's say our volume to be infused right now is 500 milliliters. So I'll put 500 for my volume to be infused. And I've got that set. We've gotten our identifiers. We did our checks, just like we did with our peripheral, making sure that the fluid doesn't have any floaties. There's no signs of rips, tears, or leaks with the bag. It's not expired and it's the, um, per the order for normal saline, we said 75. We scanned his band, we scanned the medication bag. 
We've put date, time, and initials on the bag. And if your facility's policy is to include the patient's information on there, you would do that as well. And my um, tubing is labeled with the date, time, and my initials as well. Usually, tubing can be good for every three days if it's continuous. And then I'm going to use my flush. And I need to use a blunt cannula to access. So when you get the brand new flush, like I was saying in a previous video, you pull down on the syringe a little bit and then push up to get your air bubble out so it doesn't squirt everywhere. It's gonna clean for 15 seconds. I'm gonna go with the medial one. Um, sometimes we say medial for medication to make it easier for you to remember. So we'll do the middle medial for medication, 15 second scrub. And allow it to dry and this is clamped I'm going to stab that I'm going to release my clamp now with a central line I need to get blood return so I shouldn't see nice brisk blood return so we'll say we get a nice brisk blood return and then oh, this one's leaking. <laughs> then we're going to flush This one's leaking, so this would be a big problem in a clinical setting. So we flush the full 10. I'm going to clamp. I'm going to get another alcohol swab. Again, like I said with the peripheral, if you drop it, you have to re-scrub at any time. So we'll do 15 seconds. Allow it to dry. We take our alligator and we're going to snap that on and unclamp. And then we would turn our, make sure everything is unclamped, unclamped. And my roller clamp is done, done. We've got our pump set at 75 mLs per hour, a rate of 500 mLs volume to be infused. And we're gonna hit start. Okay, and so you know a lot of pumps, if they sense air in the line or an occlusion, go back and look at your line and see, is there air bubbles in the line? If it says occlusion, it could be that your clamps aren't unclamped um, or maybe something's tangled. So take a look at your line, make sure things are unclamped and everything like that. Um, and then you would be able to hit these and see how that goes. So we'll say our primary is flowing perfectly fine. We had good blood return. We flushed with a full 10. You want to use 10 ml syringes on our um, central lines. Um, the exception would be if you need to give a very, very small dose medication, you would use a smaller syringe so you can get a very accurate dose and that would be okay. But your flushes need to be 10 before, 10 after. Some facilities require 20 ml flush after you give a med or after you draw blood. So we've got our primary line all set up. We're going to next, like our peripheral, we will do a push through the line. So you can see that it's the exact same process as with the peripheral, checking for compatibilities, um, making sure whether or not it needs to be diluted and the amount of time to push the medication over. For this one, I have Toradol. This one's 15 milligrams per milliliter. And we're gonna do a 30 milligram dose. And I'm gonna use a two or a three ml syringe for this because I wanna use two mLs. So 
So if it's compatible, uh, just like with your peripheral and you have your fluids running, you don't need to do a flush before and after. Your fluids are going to do that for you. So my order's for 30. I'm going to give 2 mLs. I've got my blunt tip here. Of course, we did all of our checks, name and date of birth. We looked up our medication to see what it's for. For him, it's for pain medication, um, usually for severe pain, a seven, a 7 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10 for severe pain can cause a little bit of drowsiness. Um, it is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so like a very super high power ibuprofen. It shouldn't be used any more than five days because it can cause damage to the kidneys. So um, lab work to look at could be your BUN and your creatinine, um, just to be mindful of that. We got his identifiers, we scanned the wristband, we did our three med checks. We've looked at our line, it's infusing without any problem. And we're doing our 15 second scrub. The fluids are running at 75 mLs per hour. I'm gonna allow that to dry. I'm gonna take my two mils and attach that. And this is where, again, we do that crimping of the line and pushing a little bit and then releasing. So for this one, uh, Toradol can be given over um, 30 seconds to a minute. So I'm gonna do a full minute for the two mLs. I'm gonna crimp and I'm gonna do 15 seconds push for a half ml for 15 seconds. Then I'm gonna release my fluids and let it wash in for 15 seconds. Next 15 seconds for the next half ml. And release for 15 seconds. Another 15 seconds. Release. And then the final 15 seconds for the remaining and then let that go and let it flush in. Check back within about 30 minutes. It's usually an hour, but it can kick in within about 15 to 30 minutes, this particular medication, um, to check for any issues uh, with potential for side effects. Um, decreased pain level is what we wanna see, okay? Alrighty. <clears throat> So that was your push through the line. Your piggyback, again, as long as it is compatible, you're gonna use secondary tubing and you can back prime. If it's not compatible with, uh, especially with central lines that have more than one lumen, the beautiful thing is, say my Zofran or my <clears throat> Zosin is not compatible with my IV fluids. Maybe I have additional electrolytes added in in a higher concentration, and this isn't compatible with that. I can use a primary line like I would use and attach my Zosin, and I would just select a different port to run it through and run it as a primary line. So that's the beauty of these uh, central lines, is you can run things that aren't compatible in the separate lumens. We're gonna say this is compatible because it is compatible, Zosin is compatible with saline. I've got my line clamped. And I'm gonna do the same process that I did with my peripheral. So remember that we have our piggyback port up here. I know that I need an alligator for this as well because I'm using a simple connector. And we wanna make sure that everything gets primed. So I attach the alligator on there. I am going to scrub for 15 seconds. Yeah, 
and allow it to dry. Snap the alligator on there. And I'm going to slowly lower this bag there below the level of the primary. It's not wanting to go. So like I said, once you're using your, your lines to practice, um, they're not going to want to function like they would because they're supposed to be single use only. So sometimes you got to give a little pressure with the bag to get the fluid to flow through. All right, so we filled no more than halfway for a back prime and I'm undoing my clamps, making sure all the clamps are good. And then I'm going to, we'll say that this is on. I'm going to stop, I'm gonna do secondary rate. This is a 50 ml bag and we're gonna run it over 30 minutes. So I'm gonna run it at 100 mls per hour and the volume to be infused is 50. I make sure all my clamps are open. I'm gonna hit secondary start. And let's see, it's being feisty. So I should see drops coming down in this chamber as a secondary. Once the secondary is done, the drops will resume down here in the primary automatically. So the process is the same way for um, your CVADs and your um, primaries with a peripheral. Okay, to convert this back to a saline, or a saline lock essentially. For discs uh, DCing our fluids. We're going to take this all down and get rid of it. We have an order to just continue. I'm going to clamp this. I'm going to unclamp my alligator. And then I'm going to scrub for 15 seconds. And since there was fluids already running from it, um, all I need to do is flush. Again, whether your facility says 10 or 20 mLs, use whatever your facility recommends. Also, taking into consideration whether your patient's on fluid restrictions or not. So 15 seconds, and we're going to flush. Whoop. So if that's disconnected like that, I'd have to get a new swab and a new flush and go ahead and flush. So we re-cleaned, we got our new flush. And it's leaking bad. All right, and we're going to clamp it and then disconnect. And that'll go into sharp. So now he's locked. If he wants to get up and walk around or whatever, um, then he is all set. And then the last thing is just doing a straight push through the um, triple lumen. So we'd need two flushes and we'd need our medication. Again, we'll use the Toradol medication. And we need a bunch of flat tips. Okay. Of course, we did all of our checks. And at the bedside, preparing after the three checks, the six rights, allergies, looking up the med, does it need to be diluted, how fast to push it, any special labs. And we don't need to worry about compatibility because it's going straight through. Got our med here, two mLs for uh, 30 milligrams of the Toradol. 
get my syringes prepared here. We're gonna flush before and after. Make sure we get our bubbles out. Here, this one is the proximal. In the real life, you use whatever lumen you got available. Um, for lab, if it helps to remember medial meds and distal for drawing blood, that's fine. But don't be afraid to use any of your lumens here. <clears throat> I'm gonna clean for 15 seconds. This is clamped. I'm going to aspirate for blood return and I get a nice good blood return and then I'm going to gently flush with the full 10 mls and I'm going to clamp then I am going to do the medication I'm going to give this over again a full minute so 15 seconds per uh, half ml. Okay, unclamp. And we're gonna time it 15 seconds per half milliliter. And then we have our final flush. And we want to push that over the same rate as the medication. So about 15 seconds per half ml. And we need to do a full 10 this one. Okay. So after a minute, I've gotten, um, two mls in. I'm going to continue to slowly push because these central lines are lo a lot longer than your peripheral um, and you don't want to just give like say two mls over the same amount of time as the medication and then whoosh the rest of it in. So we we're going to just continue a nice slow steady pressure with the remainder of the flush to make sure that that medicine gets to the bloodstream. Okay. Clamp and then I can let it go. And that is um, the end of that. Now, just so you're aware, you may see these little caps called Kuros caps or protective caps. You might see them on the end of the central lines, and this is to help prevent infection. Um, and essentially, they'll sit on the end of the central line like that. And then when you go to access it to give meds, you would just take this off. You still have to clean with an alcohol swab for 15 seconds before you access it. Um, but you'll probably see these if you have patients with central lines in the hospital, just so you know. Um, they're yellow, orange, green, any kind of variety. And I think that is it as far as medication administration through the central line. Um, we will do a central line dressing change video and central line blood draw video separately.
Okay.